After learning to drive, my mother was eager to teach others in need of liberation. I was her most resistant pupil. I finally succumbed to her wishes when faced with the challenge of renting a car in the British Isles during an upcoming vacation with a childhood friend. By then, I was in my late 20s and living in my own place in Manhattan. My parents had left Queens for a new house on Long Island. It was a grandiose idea to think I could drive on the left side of the road when I had not mastered the right. But I was still young and eager to please my licensed lacking companion, who had lived in Scotland and promised to show all if I would do the driving. My mother seized her moment and showed up on my doorstep two or three times a week for almost two months to give me driving practice. I remember almost snacking a bus once and going the wrong way down a one-way street. But none of my misjudgment seemed to faze my mother. She showed fearlessness and perfect confidence that I could do this. I would do it, and I would like it. The promise of a delicious steak dinner at the end of each session and her unshakable will got me through those initial near disasters. As skill replaced images of myself lying dead on the highway, I was surprised to discover an amazing sense of mastery and freedom emerging. Why, I could drive myself anywhere in the world, not depend, dependent on anyone else's desires or whims. My fantasy started nationally, as I imagined driving to New Mexico to eyeball the magnificent red, orange, and purple sunsets while pretending to be George O'Keefe or joining to Cape Cod off-season to talk with the ocean and walk naked on the beach. Then I became more expansive, driving to kiss the Blarney Stone. I also imagined speeding past our family doctor and giving him the finger. As I shared with my mother tentatively at first, my newfound sense of freedom and began reeling off all the adventures I might undertake. She shrieked, she shrieked with pleasure and said, let's go. Her enormous enthusiasm surprised me. I suppose I had feared abandonment. That should I, her youngest child, become truly independent, she would become distant and disapproving. But clearly, she would not let me go so easily. When I got my license on the first try, we celebrated with steaks. But as dessert, she insisted on teaching me how to get on and off the Long Island Expressway so I could drive to her house. The trip to the British Isles never materialized, but it had already served its purpose. When I drive now, more than 35 years later, whether on expeditions to freedom or journeys to fulfill burdens and responsibilities, my mother is always there, calming me in traffic, beckoning me to undertake outrageous adventures, and warning me against the temptation to be a passenger in my own life. How do you know how you look if you can't see yourself in the mirror? A stupid question for me to ask a blind friend. Others on my mirror should explain, telling me if my makeup is smudged 
where there was a glaring stain hovering over my right boob. We both laughed, but I thought she was lucky not to have to confront that internal, eternal judge at each encounter with the looking glass. At least she could choose her judges and moments of condemnation. I don't know why I'm always shocked to see myself in the mirror. Full body or headshot, the me in the mirror doesn't look like me at all. Surely, after 60 years of myriad mirror encounters, I should know what I look like. Yet I encounter a stranger each time. Who is that woman walking in such a graceless way with her knees and toes turned in, head and chest bent forward, body off balance, ready to trip over a crack in the pavement, an unnoticed step, or nothing at all? Surely not me. Why can't I claim her? Why in my mind's mirror do I see myself walking like every woman, like any woman, like anyone but this woman? As the moving marathon begins, Sylvester, Jean's big, boisterous tuxedo cat, stakes out his claim, leaping over Jean's body onto mine. He decides where to flop slowly, testing out my stomach, boobs, and shoulders, and thighs for just the right combination of meat and bone. He sits, curls, and sprawls without regard to whether his tail is in my face or his claw in my rib. I am his chaise lounge, there for his comfort. His presence, his preference for my body, tickles me. It also terrifies me. My body is in constant motion, especially when I'm lying down. I am at my own mercy, watching myself shake with no ability to stop it. Surely I could stop shaking if I really tried. A childhood myth perpetuated. My shame pervades. During sex, I wonder how my lover will react. One is supposed to lose control through orgasm, not through body wandering willy-nilly. My partner's reassurances are not convincing, a problem not unique to me or my palsied body. As Sylvester lies on me in perfect stillness, dozing off, my shame impedes my pleasure. Will my movements shake him into wakefulness? Will I hurt him, pinching his tail now lodged between my thighs, or his pink nose snuggled between my knees? Will he abandon me for Jean's more dependable body? My fear intensifies the movements. I panic. Sylvester does not. My jerking movements cause him to shift his position ever so slightly and resume his sleep. When I pull away my leg, now cramping, he finds another available part, body part. There is little my body can do to dissuade him, except sneezes, jeans or mine. Those will send him off the bed, running for cover, only to return a few moments later to reclaim his chaise lounge. Gene jokes that Sylvester always chooses me. His teasing, his teasing is tinged with jealousy. He claims that Sylvester prefers my body precisely because of my movements, that he finds them soothing, like lying on a waterbed an intriguing notion to be chosen for a bodily feature that has been a long time source of rejection. 
Sylvester will not confirm or deny the theory. By picking me, whatever the cause, Sylvester has reduced my embarrassment about my body. Better than psychotherapy. Cheaper, too. Maybe defects, differences, don't matter all that much when it comes to being lovable. Maybe we can all be the cat meow if we choose the right cat. One of the things that has been most meaningful to me is that many or number of people who are not disabled but who have been made to feel different or marginalized in their own way so relate to this. It's not the same. Each oppression is different, but there are a lot of parallels. So I think there is a lot of understanding there. Also, I've discovered there are not so many people in the world who don't feel like they've been marginalized one way or the other. Sad to say. I mean, some, some do, you know. But a lot of us have, I think it's sort of in our culture to have a lot of judgments about how we look and who we are. And so there is a big community out there who can relate to the disability experience more than, more than I realized. <laughs>